Number 30, Conjol versus Malfitano. Good afternoon, Council. Good afternoon. I'm Victoria Graffio, and I'm representing the appellant Mark Malfitano in this matter. I would request two minutes for rebuttal, please. You may. The fundamental error by the appellate division in this case was its failure to recognize that this was an at-will partnership. And it was an at-will partnership under Section 62.1b of the partnership law because it lacked a definite term or a particular undertaking. Section 12.1. Their, their argument is that's kind of a default section, right? So these are contracting parties, essentially. They enter into this partnership. They make specific rules about when it can be dissolved. So why do we need to look at that? Why would you superimpose those terms on this contract? Well, I disagree part? that in this case that it's a default rule. It's not a default rule because it's only a default rule if the parties have addressed the subject matter. Well, section, Here, there is no indication. Section 12.1 has a provision for dissolution and it, it either a vote or illegality, but could you address that? 12.1 just says that it shall, that it shall continue until the election by the partners to dissolve the partnership. That's an open-ended perpetual but provision. It, it does not represent. It sets out a procedure to make a decision um, in, in the agreement uh, and, um, and specifies that a decision has to be made by a majority of the partners. So are you saying that there has to be an express provi provision in the partnership to default? There has to be an or express. Or to not default. Excuse Go ahead. me. Go ahead. There has to be an express provision that provides, as the Gelman case indicated, uh, I thought the Gelman a case, definite oh, term. Me, I thought the Gelman case was an oral contract um, with, with none of these specific provisions. Well, certainly the facts of Gelman are very distinguishable, but the court was providing further clarification of a statutory phrase, mm -hmm. definite term. That's been upheld since 1916 in the Hardin case. So what you need to look for is, and what I can't find that my adversary and the briefs on behalf of the executive committee provide here, is what was the precise date of the termination of this partnership? That's what's required. Now, if they had put exclusive language in well, here. Is it required? They were... Let me ask this. I understand your, your, your particular undertaking and, and your definitional and your durational argument. Is it required um, where, the, where there is an actual agreement um, setting out a procedure for dissolution? Um, I see how it's required in a default proceeding under Gelman. I, I agree with you on Gelman. But, um, I'm not sure that's what we have here. Well, 12.1 mm -hmm. does not address at what point a partner so you're can, that can you're bring, even at if, what point the partnership terminates. It doesn't give us any indication. It's an, so, it's, so let me get this question out then. So you're saying that it's, it, the durational requirement is there even in an agreement, even if uh, someone is contracted to conduct their partnership in a particular way, they're required to have a set term of partnership in every partnership agreement? No, if you have what you said, that would be a particular purpose, so that would be the particular undertaking. That would take it out of the at-will provision. But the council, problem, you started to speak about exclusive language? Yes, I, what I, think it's, I think it's clear in the NRA Century case and the Prudential Insurance case that there's a number of ways that partnerships can avoid being deemed at will. One is to have exclusivity, to indicate the exclusive means of dissolving this partnership shall be, and then list those. I know that magic my adversary words. calls that magic words. <laughs> I don't think it's magic words. I think it's what we require under basic contract principles. There would still be There's no definite no, that, term that then, specificity right? supplanting the partnership law is not in this agreement. But there, even with those words, there would be no definite term. But they would be indicating that they were eliminating a partner's ability to use the partnership law 
and they were substituting the provisions of the contract. How, that's how, that's permissible, okay, and that's but, what many partnerships do. But I'm not clear how uh, how 12.1 doesn't do that. Because it just has the election by the partners to dissolve the partnership. It doesn't even say majority of the partners, quite, quite honestly. Yes, but since that's not what happened, isn't it in violation of the agreement? So does it really matter if it's at will? Does no, it really if, it's, if it's at will, a partner has the ability to rely on Section 62.1b and can notice a dissolution. Wouldn't that render other provisions of this agreement completely superfluous, though, about different means of transfer and, 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 and uh, the, the, the obligation to fulfill certain capital commitments? Uh, well, if, well, no, because they knew how to escape the requirements of the partnership law for disability and death and bankruptcy. There, they clearly indicated that those were the no, no, specific but these other provisions. Specific they wouldn't means. have any meaning if anybody, if if then a person could just, at will, declare the partnership dissolved. Particularly, well, that's, particularly the sale provisions, that's, right? That, the, the requirements. I think what Judge Stein is talking about is the provisions that say, for example, if you want to sell to a, a permitted person, then you don't need approval. But if you want to send, sell to somebody outsider like me. You've got to get a bona fide offer in writing, submitted to the committee. They have a right of first refusal. Those provisions would all be irrelevant. You could simply just dissolve, no? Well, not if you met the requirements of those provisions are established for certain fact patterns. But here, in terms of section, the section entitled dissolution does not provide specifically that only these provisions allow a partner to dissolve. Doesn't affect the other provisions of the agreement that allow transfer to a third party or that allow some, some other uh, remedies that are available to the partners. They, you know, they, the partnership law has been in existence for almost 100 years. The sky is not going to fall in by upholding the at-will rule. I mean, most partnerships, there's a number of ways that they're able to contract around it. I mean, first of all, what they could have done here when he noticed for dissolution, since there was no, well, since there's clearly no specific time limit here, they could have done the accounting, paid him his interest, and continued the business. They never dissolved in this case. There was never a termination. Well, the Sophie, mall, the there mall there was, was never out of business for even a single day. So if the partnership, this is, I've been struggling with this, if the partnership was never dissolved, how can there be a wrongful dissolution? Because upon notice of a dissolution under the partnership law, by operation of law, there's a dissolution. Dissolution is just distinct from not, termination. Right, I thought you so, said it had not dissolved. I'm sorry, I should have said had, was not terminated. Okay. They, they did not even wind down the business because they considered it a wrongful dissolution notice. They just continued the business. They eventually um, did reconstitute the, the partnership. Do you want to address the, the attorney's uh, fees question for a second? Yes. Thank you. The, I think the attorney fee award is an entirely unjustified in this case. It really violates the American rule. There's no provision for it, either in statute or in the actual partnership agreement itself. That is, uh, I, I think, a very well-established rule in New York. As a matter of fact, the transcript here on page um, B767, the attorney for the executive committee testified that less than $15,000 pertain to the actual uh, reconstitution of the partnership. So all of the other damages here, the one point million in attorney's fees that were assessed against Mr. Malfitano, those were all for litigation expenses. And in New York, in breach of agreement cases, each party bears their own fees. There was no provision in this agreement or by statutory authorization to be able to assess those council fees. So then they're entitled to the 14,000 plus, but not anything else. Is that your position? Yes, well that would be if you find that he did not wrongfully dissolve the partnership. Thank or, you. If he, or if he did, the council fees in excess of the And the, the attorney's fees question 14, isn't so. predicated on the wrongful dissolution. Correct. Right, thank you. Thank you, council. Council? Chief Judge DeFiori, and may it please the court, 
Caitlin Halligan on behalf of the Respondent Partnership. Let me start with the first question before the Court, uh, which is uh, whether or not Section 62, along with other provisions of the Uniform Partnership, provide default terms. They do. This Court has said so. I think that's a straightforward uh, question. I think the real issue for this Court is what do partners have to do to contract around the terms set forth in the UPA? Uh, as we say in our brief, there are no magic words that are required for a couple of reasons. First of all, the Uniform Partnership Act, as this Court has stressed, places primacy on the ability of partners to pick the terms that they want. There is no formula that is required if the legislature... There must be some threshold. What's the threshold? Absolutely, Your Honor. The partners have to make clear that they do not intend a partnership to be at will. They have absolutely done so here. The provisions that a few of, of uh, the members of the court identified with respect to transfer rights, as well as capital calls, as well as the, the clear language in 2.3 and 12.1 that the partnership, quote, shall continue until one of several enumerated events happens, makes absolutely clear that the partnership is not intended to be at will. Those are completely mutually inconsistent. And indeed, if you were to deem a partnership like this at will, then any time a partner didn't want to abide by a number of the other provisions in the agreement, such as the transfer restrictions or the capital call, she could simply decide to dissolve at will and walk away. Those provisions would be rendered completely nugatory. That is also why the wide array of amici that have filed before this court have said that reading this partnership agreement to be at will, notwithstanding the clear choice that the partners made to the contrary, would be very destabilizing. So, so counsel, my, my earlier question I'm still wrestling with, yes. which is you essentially are saying, and suppose I agree with you, that there's a contract that says a single partner cannot dissolve the partnership. Yes. Right then a single partner saying I'm dissolving the partnership has no legal effect. So why is there a wrongful termination here? And let me, let me posit this yes, to sir. you, that the wrongful termination provision in, in the statute is meant to deal with circumstances where the partner, the terminating partner in question actually has managerial authority over the partnership. That would be the wrongful termination or uh, dissolution because the whole thing is gone. But where if, I mean, if I announce I'm king of England, I'm not king. Well, Your Honor, a, a couple of points. The, the, first of all, if you look at Section 62, right? Section 62, which is what uh, my adversary relies upon to suggest that this is uh, an at-will partnership, says that the partnership can be dissolved in contravention of the agreement between the partners where the circumstances don't permit a dissolution under any other provision. That's section 62 sub 2. That, I would argue, is exactly what happened here. The dissolution, because it was not in conformance with 2.3 and 12.1, was in contravention of the agreement. We do not dispute that a partner has the power to walk away from a partnership. What Section 69 then does is to explain what the consequences of a wrongful dissolution are. Section 69 explains that in the event of a dissolution, if the dissolution is permissible, the partnership property after liquidation is allocated among the partners on a pro rata basis. Is that because under the law you can't force people to stay in a partnership? Absolutely, and we don't, we don't contest that, Your Honor. Uh, there's, I think, no question about that. I've seen no decision from any court suggesting that you can bind a partner, just like with breach of contract. <laughs> so you the may business breach. continues and they form some other partnership? Yeah, yes, absolutely, Your Honor, and that is pursuant to, and this is the power that was authorized here, uh, and uh, I think page B50 of the Court's opinion confirms this. This is section 69.2b. That is what makes clear that in the event of a wrongful dissolution, then the remaining partners, they have two options. They can liquidate, and the Court sets forth the damages that uh, the, the statute first sets forth that in the event of a wrongful dissolution, the wrongful dissolver has to pay damages to so, the remaining so if they partners. Continue, if they continue or reformulate the partnership yes. or whatever they do, and, and then th there has to be some determination of who owes who what. Exactly. Right? Okay. So why uh, in the situation we have here, yes. 
um, should we not apply the reasoning in Friedman as it relates to the minority discount? I think that's the only question of law with respect to the valuation that's before this court, Your Honor. Um, I would direct uh, the court to a couple of decisions uh, which explain, I think, very clearly why a minority discount properly applies under Section 69, even though it clearly does not under Friedman for purposes of BCL Section 623. Anastas from the Massachusetts Supreme Court, these are cited in the briefs, and Vic, which is from the Appellate Division First Department. Here's why Friedman doesn't apply. The two statutory regimes, the BCL and the appraisal rights that it offers to minority shareholders, and the allocation of partnership property under Section 69 are completely different in two critical respects. The text of the statutes, first of all, is different. BCL 623 allows for a minority shareholder to get fair value. The statute makes clear that this is a remedial provision that is designed to protect the rights of minority shareholders. There is also an independent. Well, so my question is: Is why why is a um, is a partner who yes. has a tiny percentage yes. of ownership? Why is that partner in any different position than a minority? Well, shareholder? because because what Section 69 is intended to do is not to protect the rights of minority shareholders. Those are protected otherwise in the partnership law in several ways, several important ways. First of all, if a minority partner believes that her fiduciary duty has been breached by the other partner, she can bring a suit. She can seek an accounting. She can also seek judicial dissolution. In this case, Your Honor, the appellant sought each and every one of those remedies which are available to him and any other minority partner under the law, and Supreme Court determined that those claims were patently devoid of merit. So there are protections available under the partnership law. They are different protections than the protection available under the BCL. Under the BCL, there is also an additional independent statutory prohibition under 501C that says you may not treat minority and majority shareholders when they own the same class of stock differently. Partnership law is set up completely differently, and that's what Anastos and Vic explain. What Section 69 is intended to do is to require a wrongful dissolver, like someone who breaches a contract, to absorb the consequences of that action. So the partner is free. So that, that could mean, like in this case, that they owe the, the breaching partner, the minority holder, yes. whatever it is, 2.68 percent, whatever, 3.08, I'm sorry, I can't remember. Three uh, points, you're right, Your Honor. Right, over a million dollars. And let me explain why. And Your Honor, yeah. let me acknowledge that this is an unusual. It was a 66 percent share on that minority, right? That that was the the, the minority election? discount was 66 percent. That's something that uh, there's perfectly strong factual support mm -hmm. for. It's question that particular well, issue. Well, it, it wasn't it wasn't contested by their expert. Isn't that the core of your Absolutely argument? correct. You, you know, while, while we're on the topic, and you, I want you to answer, Judge. Yes. Uh, Judge Rivera's question, but can you also address, I, I struggle with what the difference is between a marketability discount yes, and a minority Honor. discount. Let me, I, go ahead. Let me try to address that and also uh, address Your Honor's question about how could it be that someone owes money when they're trying to walk away from a partnership. A marketability discount, uh, Your Honor, is uh, intended to account for the relative illiquidity of an asset. So if you have something right, that. Right, right, but they both involve lack. I, no, I, I read it. Okay. <laughs> I understand that. My, I, my point is, is, that, is that they both, both, both address the question of a lack of control. No, I, I believe not, Your Honor. You think it's different? I do think it's different. Okay. A, minority, a minority discount clearly does address a lack of control. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Pangia, which, which was uh, the partnership's expert, explains the way in which they are distinct. The reports are included in the record. So, so the minority discount accounts for the lack of control. And in this partnership, because there are significant powers uh, accorded to the executive committee and to the majority, that discount was substantial. By distinction, a marketability discount. Well, what, wasn't there a clause in the partnership agreement that, that set up a penalty for a, a five-year penalty? Can yes, and, and, yeah. and, and there are, were other restrictions as well. And, and in general, in a partnership, 
as Mr. Pangea testified to, um, a holder of minority interest may face some discount of varying degrees. And that discount reflects what the market would pay if a third party were to attempt to purchase the asset, taking into account that there is limited control. If I may just finish, yeah. Your Honor. A marketability discount simply reflects relative illiquidity, uh, and, and those are distinct, and the expert reports uh, lay that out. If I may just answer your question, Judge Rivera. Um, with respect to the bottom line dollar amount here, once the goodwill was discounted and the dam uh, as required by statute and the marketability and minority discounts were applied, the share that Mr. Malfitano had, the value was approximately $911,000, which he would have received. The statute instructs that a wrongful dissolver pay damages to the partnership. That is set forth in Section 69-2A. Since Supreme when Court found these been been considered damages, though. At, well, at, first of all, Your Honor, I think there's no question but that a statute can authorize the payment of attorneys' fees. Yes, sure, and, and, and so can a contract. A, absolutely, uh, and so the factual finding that Supreme Court made that the partnership had no choice but <coughs> to pursue a declaration of wrongful dissolution in order to exercise its rights under Section 69 to reconstitute the partnership. I would, I would urge your honor to look at Section 69 b That is what allows the partnership to reconstitute under the same name and to continue. That is available in the event of a wrongful dissolution. So as Supreme Court found, it was necessary to secure a declaration of wrongful dissolution in order to exercise that right. And I urge the court to look at pages B40 to 43. Supreme Court lays out the devastating consequences that it would have resulted in to not proceed with this litigation, explained that it was Mr. Maffetano's that, actions. That can be said of, of almost any situation, can it? If, if I didn't go to court to preserve my rights, I would have been further damaged? Uh, no, Your Honor. I think that what, well, what mean, Supreme it, Court says is that it was an absolutely direct connection. I think that's a finding of fact that is with respect, not before this court. And I think if you look at Section 69 Isn't it about two, the loan? Isn't that what was going on if they didn't get this loan? The, well, it was, a, it was a refinancing. And, and Mr. Malfitano, who was counsel to the companion management company, um, was uniquely aware of the consequences of his actions. So I think Supreme Court explains why it is that incurring these fees to prosecute this action, including nine appeals, 10 years of litigation that Mr. Malfitano chose to proceed with was directly occasioned by and made necessary by his actions. There are no Thank other you, questions. Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Counsel? If you disagree with us that this was an at-will partnership, and I think if you look at Section 62.2, you're going to see the structure of the partnership law is that it is only in contravention of a part of the partnership law if it meets one of the provisions of, this, of the section. And here, of course, we don't have either the particular undertaking or, this, or the specific term of duration. But in any event, if you disagree with us, Section 69, regardless of whether it's legitimate or wrongful dissolution, the partner is entitled to the interest. What I think went astray in this case is that Supreme Court ignored the testimony of my client's expert and went entirely with the testimony of the executive committee's expert. And it's contrary to law. Is that Goodwill, true, is that, excuse me. Is that true, Counselor, on the minority discount question? Well, I, minority, I thought, minority discount, I think, under the Vic case and under um, the No, Friedman, I mean the testimony of the expert. I thought your expert the only The testify. only area my, our expert did not testify to was Goodwill because he felt there was no goodwill under New York law according to um, the you, rule that real can, estate holding companies. You can correct companies. me if I'm wrong, but I had thought your expert testified. Uh, he didn't testify as to a number, simply said that there was not a legal basis for a minority discount. Is that correct? Yes, that's, that's correct. That's it's right. not so, that so they he didn't, didn't address it at number. all. 
they didn't offer an alternative number. Am I right about that? No, because they relied upon the fact um, that he had not wrongfully or maliciously brought this notice of dissolution. He had very legitimate reasons for feeling that it was an inappropriate refinancing. There was no serious ramification. They consummated the refinancing within 30 days of when he filed his notice of dissolution. So that, that was not a problem. But goodwill has to be a recognized asset of the corporation. The record here shows that they never carried it on their financial statements. It wasn't in the partnership agreement. It wasn't on any tax returns. It was never viewed as an asset of the partnership. And under the Cohen and Sink cases, I think it's pretty clear that you don't have goodwill for real estate holding companies. They were not involved in the management of the mall at all. It was the pyramid group that negotiated the leases, that was in charge of the employees, that handled all the day-to-day -day -day operations of the mall. And then marketability, unless you have goodwill, you don't have marketability. That's under the Vic and Cohen cases. So without goodwill, they don't also, the 35% discount for marketability was not appropriately assessed. And then we get the 66% for the minority. I would ask this court to look at the, I think, very apt rationale of the Louisiana court in the Cannon case, which clearly indicates the policy underpinnings for not harnessing a minority partner with only a 3% interest and that it ends up with a windfall and it encourages um, the majority members to act even against the interest of minority members because it enhances their value. I want to remind the court that Mr. Malfitano did not initiate this litigation. He was stuck for over 10 years in this costly, contentious litigation. All he wanted was to have his interest valued properly. They refused to re um, produce any books and records. They would not submit to an accounting. He asked the court for judicial, he asked the court for judicial dissolution. He asked for accounting. Every one of his requests were denied. What was he to do? He had to defend himself. This is a very considerable asset that he lost and ended up with a judgment of over a million dollars against him for a 3% interest in this partnership. Thank you. Thank you, counsel.